book of Isaiah, chapter 35, and we'll begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, and the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools, uh, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there. But the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you. Thank you for the good singing. Thank you for the good testimonies. Thank you for being a good God. Now, Lord, thank you for the sweetness of thy spirit. Thank you for the truth and the joy of thy word. Now, Father, help us tonight to once again realize the excellency of our God. Do something uh, supernatural in our hearts and lives. Stir our minds of a remembrance of those great things you have done for us. Stir our hearts unto righteousness and stir our feet uh, uh, in the direction of sinners that we may tell them how wonderful Jesus really is. Bless now and meet each and every need of every heart. And Father, get glory to your glorious name. We'll fail uh, not to bow these unworthy heads and thank you for how great you really are. Help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Chapter 34 of the book of Isaiah is a prophecy concerning uh, the end of the great tribulation period and it uh, culminates in the battle of Armageddon. Uh, not that I'm some uh, uh, great scholar on the end times. I have studied estology, and I can tell you this. There is coming a point uh, when all nations shall turn against Israel. There is coming a point when uh, uh, not only will they turn against in Israel, they will make war with Israel uh, in a place uh, called the Valley of Megiddo. And that place, they tell me, is the most perfect place uh, for a battlefield, for a battle to take place. Uh, and once that battle takes uh, uh, place and uh, takes hold, uh, it looks like Israel is going to go down for the last time and she's going to be annihilated off the face of the earth. Uh, and it's at that point uh, when the Lord Jesus himself shall come in glory uh, and return back to this earth, uh, he's going to land on the Mount of Olives, it'll split in two, uh, and he's going to put an end to that great battle, the battle of Armageddon, uh, and he's going to destroy all the enemies of Israel. Uh, well, that's chapter 34. By the time we get to chapter 35... Uh, we find uh, uh, what is in the mindset of Israel now that uh, 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 she has uh, uh, been uh, relieved from the battle of Armageddon. Uh, and chapter 35 starts uh, uh, the beginning process of the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, my dear friends, where does that leave us? Uh, you and I that are saved, you and I that have been washed in the blood of Jesus, you and I that uh, uh, know that our name's written in the Lamb's book of life, uh, 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 seven years prior to that battle of Armageddon, the trumpet's going to sound, uh, uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first, uh, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up uh, uh, with them to meet the 
Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, uh, we'll be caught out of here. We'll be raptured out of here uh, and we'll go on uh, uh, to uh, face Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, then we'll go to the marriage supper. Uh, we'll don the wedding garment uh, and we'll feast and uh, 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 be uh, officially married to Christ where the bride of Christ now will be uh, uh, a part of Christ then. Uh, and then in Revelation 19 after the marriage supper uh, you find that's when he returns uh, and he comes uh, in the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God uh, and a sharp two-edged sword goes out of his mouth uh, and we the redeemed uh, uh, come with him uh, riding on white horses uh, and we will be a witness to him destroying the enemies of Israel and then during the millennial reign we'll rule and reign with him uh, forevermore uh, well with that in mind Look in uh, verse number 35. And I want you to look at an oppressed people who thought that they were going to be snuffed out of the earth, who thought that it was over for them, and yet God showed up in their greatest hour of need. I want you to notice, first of all, the dearth in verse number 1. The Bible says, "...the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them." And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Now can I say that Israel in the book of Revelation must flee to the wilderness because the Antichrist uh, and uh, all those that uh, the powers of be who uh, 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 have taken the mark of the beast who are under the rulership of the Antichrist begin to seek out Israel and destroy them because they are God's chosen people. They flee to the wilderness. Here we find that the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. Glad for who? For the Israelites. Because they've been hunted, they've been stalked, they've been sought after, they've been martyred, they've been destroyed. But now Jesus has showed up. And now the very refuge for them, the wilderness and the solitary place, is glad for them. Why? Because now the wilderness is about ready to be blessed because of them. The wilderness is always a place uh, 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 of darkness, a place of bondage. Uh, the solitary place, the desert place, always speaks of a dearth, uh, always speaks of lifelessness, uh, always speaks of no hope, uh, always speaks of fear. Uh, but now the very things uh, uh, that brought fear are rejoicing because the Prince of Peace has showed up. Hmm? Have you ever seen any of them animated movies when there's somebody wicked in power and everything is destroyed? Whether it's a, everything turns to ice or everything turns to darkness or everything turns to stone and then the prince shows back up and all of a sudden flowers start blooming all of a sudden the sun shines again all of a sudden the ice melts away the darkness flees and everything. You know where they got that concept? Isaiah 35. Amen. Because when the prince of peace shows up when the king of glory takes his rightful place upon the throne of David, this very world, which has been in darkness, will come alive and come to light and spread his light. We see the dearth. Now notice the delighting in verse number 2. Again, talking about the wilderness, the dark place, the fearful place. It says, It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. Uh, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Uh, and then it goes on to say, Strengthen ye weak hands uh, and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Uh, even God with a recompense, He will come uh, and save you. We see the delighting because they're delivered. Hmm? And can I say, Jesus always came seeking to deliver, Amen. and he will deliver Israel. Now, my dear friends, we've been in some darkness, but yet the Lord has shined on us. He has shined on us so we would delight in Him. We'd understand His deliverance. Uh, we find in these verses the dividend. Look in verse number 8. Uh, 
It says, and a highway shall be there in a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. Uh, what a blessing uh, that there is a, a way uh, uh, that doesn't seem right to man, but a way that leads to God, and a way of holiness, and a way of righteousness, uh, and a way that is worth trespassing on. Uh, we see there is a dividend for being saved. There is a holy way. Hmm? Thank God, Brother Brian, for another day. Thank God there is a way that folks, when they're redeemed, can walk on. We, we do have a way that this world doesn't understand. Sure. We do understand that He knows our name. Because He walks with us and talks with us. And as Bella and Caitlin saying, uh, He is our friend. And we have that relationship. They don't. And we do have access to Him because He is the way, the truth, and the life. Notice, if you will, the debunked or the defiled. This is the whole crowd that understand, don't understand why we need church. Look what it says in verse 8. It says, But the unclean shall not pass over, over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men. Though fools shall not err therein, no lion shall be there, no ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there. You see, those that don't know God, they can't walk in the ways of God. There are a lot of people that say that they're a Christian, but they don't understand really what's going on in our hearts and lives. Amen. There are a lot of people scared to death about all this stuff going on in the world. They're scared to death about uh, uh, catching things and everything. And the last thing you don't want to do is go to church because church don't care about people. Church wants to kill people. That's why you're coming out. You know you came out today to kill people. That's what they say. You don't care about life. Do you understand that in the state of Kentucky, almost four times uh, uh, the number of deaths of COVID virus over the last uh, uh, two months, there's been more, more than four times the death considered, uh, given because of abortion? Don't tell me they care about life. This thing isn't about life. It's about control. Hmm? And by the way, who's to say you catch it at church? You might have caught it at Kroger's. Uh, somebody might have had it and touched that banana that you bought. Could have got it from that. You might have got it from checking your mail. You do know with anything that anybody's had it and they, they touch it and they can stay alive on it for three days. Hmm? Some mail sorter might have had coronavirus, touched your mail, got to the mailman, and he brought it to your house. You went out thinking you got to, uh, uh, the sweepstakes and went in $7,000 a week for the rest of your life. And what you got was coronavirus. Uh, but churches wants to kill people. No, churches is in the saving business. Hmm? But then I want you to notice the delegates. Look in verse number 9 again. It says, But the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Now this is literally talking about those that fled to the wilderness. When the Lord shows up, they're going to come back to Zion, to Jerusalem. And they're coming back with singing. There'll be no more sighing and sorrow. There is no more hunting after their life. Uh, uh, the redeemed have walked the holy highway and got back to Jerusalem. Uh, and there, hallelujah, they're going to be with the Lord. Uh, Amen. You and I that are the redeemed today, we understand that no matter what oppressor may come after us, there is a place that we can come back to, a place called the house of God where we can come back with singing and joy and with praising because of what God's done in our hearts and our lives. We can draw some great comparisons from this chapter. But I'm interested in verse number 6. It says, Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness shall break out and streams in the desert. Now I'm interested in that phrase, streams in the desert. Now I don't know about you, I've never really been in the desert when you look like me and you're exposed to a lot of sun, you come out, you look like Brother James' shirt back there. Hmm? Uh, I try to avoid sun. My wife, my daughter, 
They love the beach. Uh, they go to the beach. I go to a bookstore. Hmm? Uh, me and the sun don't get along. I reflect the sun. I do not take in the sun. I know there are some of you that you like the sun. God bless you. Have at it. Huh? But I, I, I don't generally get up and say, I want to go roam in a desert somewhere. Hmm? <laughs> Number one, the desert is hot. It's sandy. They get some of them wind storms in the desert and the sand to cut you in half. Hmm? Why do you think they call it sandblasting? They use sand and pressure to take rust off of stuff. Doesn't sound like my place where I want to hang out. Uh, the vegetation is cactuses. Nobody's ever said, boy, isn't that a beautiful cactus? Now, I know you can get a little one and put it around your house. They're ugly, and if, you don't, if you're not careful, they'll hurt you. huh? They say you can cut them open. they got water in them, but good luck cutting it open. You're going to get cut up cutting it open, huh? And you know what else they have in desert? Snakes. <laughs> Need I say any more? They got all kinds of things. They got something they call sidewinders. Huh? I don't know what that is, but I don't need to be around it. Hmm? Uh, so, you know, everything I've ever seen about deserts and seen movies about deserts and read about deserts, uh, uh, deserts are a destitute place. I, I mean, the only thing goes to deserts go there to die. Hmm? There's not life, and, and people that get caught up in the desert, and they wrap a towel around their head and go, you try to hold the moisture in, uh, but they go long enough without water in the desert, they start seeing oasis uh, uh, that aren't there, mirages that aren't there. Uh, uh, every one of them dream that they see a Hawaiian island right there, but it ain't there, huh? And they begin to even try to drink the sand, thinking it's water. So there's never any picture painted of anything pleasant in a desert. Would you agree? When was the last time you say, well, no, I, I don't want to go somewhere beautiful like Hawaii for a dream vacation. Send me to the Sahara. <laughs> we don't think in those terms. Because there's nothing pleasant there. Anybody ever seen that show, uh, Home Rescue? Where there's this family from Alaska that lived off the land, and they go around and they try to help people that are trying to learn to live off the land. I've seen one where this family bought all kinds of land in a desert. Bought it for pennies on it for like $20,000, got like 1,000 acres. Yeah, you got taken. No? And they're trying to survive in a desert without water. And this family had to go and they had to bring in this real expensive crew to dig and dig and drill for, for water. They finally found some water. What a blessing. But who goes to live in a desert? We don't go to live in it. So when you read the Bible and you're talking about uh, uh, fearful places and dark places and destitute places and all of a sudden the Bible right in the midst of all this says streams in the desert. Said when God shows up, it's going to be like streams in the desert. Now, I don't want to speak volumes to us because if, I think if there's one thing a desert would say of all the things they want, they don't want gold, they don't want glitter. Those in the desert say, if you can send anything, send us some streams. And he said, when God shows up, that's exactly what you'll find are streams in the desert. With that in mind, I'd like to just give you a few things this evening on the streams in the desert. Can I say something about these streams in the desert? First of all, they reveal the persistence of God. Amen. Only God can care so much to pin down and say that there's coming a day when you'll find streams in the desert. We're talking about God who made a perfect place called Eden and made man in his own image and made him perfect. Man that walked with God in the cool of the day. Man that uh, had a true uh, 
physical relationship with Almighty God and then man chose to mess it up and then the world became cursed and sin came not only to man but to this world and the very things that I mentioned that harm you and that brought harm to this world came as a result of sin. Before sin, no rose bush had thorns. Before sin, no snake had venom. Before sin, there was nothing to hurt and nothing to harm. There were no viruses. There was no sickness. There was no sorrow. There was no death. There was nothing but pure bliss with God. But then man chose to sin. And the world got shaken off of its foundation. And the earth became cursed because of sin. And deserts dried up. But God in His persistence, some 7,000 years later, chooses to make certain that things are put back on course and there'll be streams in the desert. Only the great God of glory is so concerned and so long-suffering and so persistent that he is going to right every wrong. When he says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. That goes far beyond uh, 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 his people being taken care of. Uh, 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 the Bible says in Romans uh, uh, chapter 1 that the very earth groans uh, for Jesus to come back. Uh, the very deserts uh, uh, howl in the night for the Lord to return and right the wrongs. Uh, so there'll be streams in the desert. Uh, dear preacher friend of mine brother Andy Wells I saw the other day he was standing by a mountain spring and he says this mountain spring he go, he's went to very uh, a lot of times over his life and, and uh, he loves uh, uh, being in the nature and being in the wilderness and Andy is a brilliant man but Andy needs to get right with God because Andy catches snakes hmm? <laughs> but brother Andy uh He's standing by this uh, 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 mountain spring just coming out of the mountain and he said this and it caught my mind. It probably got my mind thinking for this whole message uh, about the persistence of God. Uh, he said that uh, uh, there have been times when in the lowland there's been droughts uh, and there's been times in the lowland uh, uh, where they hadn't had rain. Uh, but he said there's never been a time uh, that he hadn't gone up to the mountain uh, and hadn't got by that little stream that it wasn't flowing. Uh, and isn't that just like the persistence of God uh, when everything else dries up uh, when everything else looks like it has no hope uh, if you can just get to the mountain where God's at uh, there's always flowing water uh, God is persistent uh, it isn't based upon uh, our circumstance uh, it isn't based upon our obstacles uh, it isn't based upon our goodness or our righteousness uh, but God is faithful uh, and he is persistent and friend he's always got a cool drink of water for his own and God always keeps the water flowing uh, even in a desert place we see the persistence of God in the streams of the desert it also speaks of the power of God Amen. only God can keep streams in the desert only God can provide a stream in the desert only God can provide water where water shouldn't be. Amen. It speaks of the power of God. Only There are some things only God can do. Yes, Miss Brandy, I have no doubt that surgeons could remove nodules from a little squirt stroke. But surgeons can't make them disappear. But God can. Yes, hmm? yes, uh, there are just some things reserved for God and God alone. There are just some things that don't make sense uh, only to say this, but God. <laughs> oh, when God gets to moving, uh, you can even have uh, wells of water in a desert place. Uh, when God gets to moving, uh, even the sinners uh, that Brother Brian we think may never get saved, uh, He can still touch their heart, uh, save their soul, uh, change their life, uh, take them to glory. Uh, don't give up on the power of God. Uh, if He can put a stream in the desert, uh, He can sure answer your prayer. Uh, he can sure meet that need. Uh, he can sure deliver you uh, and deliver your need. Uh, 
It speaks of the persistence of God. It speaks of the power of God. Just a little phrase in the Scripture, streams in the desert. It tells me what a God. Not only His persistence and His power, but it reveals the provision of God. Only God can put a stream where somebody needs a stream when there should be no stream. You say, tell me what you're talking about, Brother Doug. Well, I remember over in 1 Kings chapter number 18 where there's a famine in a land where there is no more water, hadn't rained in three and a half years. But God tells his servant to go by the Cherith. And guess what? Every morning, every afternoon, every evening, uh, old Elijah could go out there uh, and he could get him a drink out of Cherith. Uh, every morning, uh, every evening, uh, God said, you not only need a little water, uh, let me fly in a raven with some bread uh, and some flesh. Uh, I don't know where they got the bread. Uh, I don't know where they got the flesh. Uh, but I know God's got a bountiful supply. Uh, and if God can use a raven uh, and a brook uh, to meet the needs uh, of one prophet, uh, I've got good news. He's the same God today. Uh, and he still has the same provisional supply. Uh, God's way well able to take care of you and I. Uh, I'm glad, hallelujah, God's in control. Uh, David said he'd never seen the righteous forsaken, uh, nor his seed begging bread. Uh, hey, aren't you glad you still got a job? Uh, aren't you glad you still got your health? Uh, aren't you glad, hallelujah, uh, you've been able to make it through these dark days? Uh, aren't you glad God's been good? Uh, hey, what a God we serve. Uh, I said it this morning, it dumbfounded me. We went weeks without passing an offering plate, but our offerings went up. Say, so how can that happen? People are losing their job. The government's going more bankrupt sending out stimulus checks. Uh, how in the world did that crowd down there at Emmanuel Baptist Church uh, keep going? How did their offerings go up? Uh, uh, let me tell you how. Uh, his name is Jesus, uh, and he is well able to take care of us. Uh, isn't it amazing? Brashear thought he was doing us a favor by shutting us down. And then we found God's favor while we were shut down. Huh? Oh, what a God. Huh? Huh? I really hope Andy gets to meet him one day. So he says he's a deacon. I would to God he gets saved. There's a lot of deacons in hell. There have been a lot of preachers harassed over the years by deacons. Hmm? Deacons think they're supposed to run the church. I got news for you. Jesus runs the church. He's the head of it, huh? That didn't cost anything extra. I just had to throw something in there, huh? Hey, these streams in the desert speak of the persistence of God, the power of God, the provision of God, but also the perplexity of God. Who cares about a desert anyway? Really? When you said your prayers last night next to your bedside... You said, oh, now I lay me down to sleep. God bless the deserts. <laughs> When's the last time you ever prayed for God to bless a desert? Have you ever prayed for God to bless a desert? There's one desert I'd like to see happen. It's over there, right around Babel. We know it as Baghdad. I wish that whole crowd over there would just be a sea of glass, huh? And one day it will be. I've read the book. Hmm? Ah, for all the murderous uh, terrorist acts that they've done in this world one of these days they're getting theirs but I've never prayed for God to bless the desert but here we find God puts streams in a desert God's so good he even blesses a desert when nobody even prays for the desert now think about that brother Donald I know your friend brother Stephen prayed for you but before he even met you and prayed for you and God was uh, sending some streams in your desert because uh, he knew you needed some water one of these days and then he put Stephen in your life and then he moved into your life huh? and then he blessed you with this crowd Amen. I mean you didn't get a stream you got streams huh? Huh? 
I'm going to leave all that alone. <laughs> huh? Huh? Only God thinks about blessing a desert because just perhaps somebody's going to come by and need a drink of water. It speaks of the perplexity of God. Nobody prays for a desert. Nobody prays for God's blessings in something like that. But God is so perplexed, He even blesses the desert. Oh, i got a verse for you. This will help you. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! Exclamation point. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out! Another exclamation point. We don't know why God would be interested in putting a stream in a desert, but God's ways are past finding out. That means that God, in His infinite wisdom, knows somehow, some way, there needs to be a stream in a desert. And God put it there. Just like they used the analogy with Him, there was a time you was in a desert place. And God put a stream in your life. Are you listening? And there was a time when uh, you needed a drink, uh, just like that woman at the well. Uh, hey, uh, you thought life would never be able to amount to anything, uh, but you went to uh, seeking for a drink, uh, and you not only got a drink, you got living water, you got Him. Uh, and oh, what a blessing for the perplexity of God. Uh, I don't know why God does what He does, and it's not my business to know. He's God. All he told me to do was follow him. Hmm? So my dear friends, the streams in the desert speak of the perplexity of God. Then I thought about this. It also speaks of a promise that only God can offer. Hmm? When Jesus met that woman at the well, he said for her to give him a drink. And then he said, if you'd known who asked you to give a drink, you'd ask me for a drink. She said, sir, you don't even have anything to draw with. He said, well, what I have to drink is living water. Sure. Hmm? Said, it'll be a well within you, bubbling up. Sure. All of a sudden, her ears picked up. She got to thinking, here, I've got a scarred life. And if I don't have to come out here in the shame and the heat of the afternoon to draw water, I could have living water that's always available. She said, I want some of that. And the more he got to talking, the more she got to feeling how low and sorry for her sin. Before long, she proclaimed he was the Christ. Uh, she accepted him there, got a drink of living water, left her water pot, uh, and went and told the whole town, Come see a man. Is this not the Christ? Uh, you see, the Lord can offer a promise that nobody else can. Right. He looks at you and I and he offers eternal life. Nobody else can offer you that promise. He offers you a peace that passeth understanding. He offers you a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He offers you a clean slate. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. He offers you, uh, my dear friends, a lily in your valley. He offers you, my dear friends, uh, uh, the very breath in your body, life, and life more abundantly. Amen. You see, streams in the desert show that God's able to do not only the impossible, the unfathomable. What you can't even fathom in your mind is possible, God can do. Amen. He offers streams in the desert. You know what? makes a stream in the desert so much more sweet when you're thirsty enough to search for a stream in the desert. Yep. Let me ask you something. Are you really thirsty? Are you thirsty enough to look His way? Say, so, Lord, if you put a stream in the desert... You sure can send revival to this wicked land. You sure can transform our church into higher heights than we could ever dream possible. Lord, you sure can send a multitude of sinners in to get saved. Listen, he knows we can't go out and knock on doors. We get shot. 
Isn't it amazing? They'll let Amazon bring them a package, but they wouldn't want us to bring them a track. But you know what? He knows our limitation doesn't limit him. He can still send them in. Hmm? It's a blessing when you bring them in, but even when you can't bring them in, he can send them in. All he's asking for us to do is be thirsty enough to ask for a little drink of water. Ask for him to put a stream in our desert. Ask for him to satisfy that emptiness in our soul. See, if you're not careful, here's what's going to happen. More and more is going to get opened up. Won't be long. Hobby Lobby will be back open. And you'll get thirsty for that. And you won't be thirsty for Him. My question again, are you thirsty? The Lord wants to give you a stream in your desert that'll satisfy a whole lot more than that 40% off coupon at Hobby Lobby. He wants to satisfy you from the inside out. You know why people have to go to Hobby Lobby and Dollar General and the mall and all those places? Because there's something missing in their life. It's one thing to have a need and go buy something. There's somebody, there are some people that feel like their life ceases to exist if they can't go and run and run and run and run and look and look and look and hold the new shiny things out there wishing they had them. When what you really need is a good drink in your desert Amen. from the all-sufficient one. I wonder what would happen if we'd get thirsty for him as much as we are thirsty for everything to open up and get back to normal. He's got streams for deserts. He's just looking for some desert people. Some people destitute for his water. I wonder tonight if you're willing to admit to God that you really haven't thirsted for him like you should and that your life really is a desert place without him. Amen. Huh? I said early on what makes Bella different than all of us and what we need some of hers. She don't have any pride. Oh, yeah, she's stubborn. We're stubborn too. But Bella loves the things of God. Bella would never resist the things of God. She loves coming to church. She loves the thought of visitation. She loves the thought of vacation Bible school. She loves the thought of, of getting a glass of water for the preacher. I wonder if you love God enough to admit you need a glass of water from Him. Ask Him to satisfy that thirsty part of your soul. Let's all stand, Brother Ray, you come. While He's coming, they pick out a song of invitation. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for streams in the desert parts of our lives. Lord, we've been in a desert. And Lord, if we're hungering and thirsting for anything more than you, we're still in a desert. So I pray that our thirst would be quenched only by you. I pray you'd satisfy us with your living water. I pray that you would pour out of yourself something so supernatural, it not only changes our heart and our desires, but it changes our countenance to what others can see, what great things God can do. Now, Father, send revival. Lord, may it begin here tonight. May it begin in me. May it begin in the hearts of your people. God bless as only you can. Thank you for being so perplexed we can't figure you out. But God, thank you for enough faith we can just follow you. Now bless, help your people. Lord, I pray they wouldn't let pride keep them from where God wants them to be. Get glory to your name. We'll bless you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.